Hey guys, I'm Lucas and this is K News covering the Russian launch of Rokot. The launcher is one of Russia's smallest and is derived from an intercontinental ballistic missile or ICBM for short. Its first stage is powered by four small engines with 500 kN of thrust each and is roughly 2.5 meters in diameter. On top is a small second stage, which again carries a small derivative of the Breeze Upper stage, which is used by many other Russian rockets and can be reignited up to seven times in this version. Such ICBMs are designed to fly ballistic curves and aim their warhead right on target. This is in theory the same principle SpaceX uses to aim their booster at the drone ship, so if Russia wanted, they could build something very similar, I think. Since they have a huge country, they wouldn't even need to land on a ship and could simply aim for a landing site on ground. Anyways, the payload behind the fairing is of course not a warhead and will instead give them a further push to reach a stable orbit. The launch will take place at the Plechetsk Cosmodrome, which is located in northwest Russia, not far away from Scandinavia. Liftoff is scheduled for 2 pm UTC or 7 pm locally. Rokot will head north in direction of the North Pole to ultimately achieve a polar orbit. Behind the fairing is the second GOIK2 satellite. Its younger brother, who launched back in 2011, sadly didn't make it and re entered back into the atmosphere two years later because the Breeze Upper stage failed to do its final burn. Both have the same purpose and the first shall be replaced by a third one, launching next year. Their main mission is the so-called geodesy. The satellites are used to measure the Earth's elevation and gravitational field for which ground bases are needed. For that the satellite carries mirrors and multiple ground stations can shoot their lasers at it and measure the distance by counting the time it takes for the laser to bounce back. Light is pretty fast but still limited at the speed of light. Just for example, at a distance of 1000 km, it would take the signal 0.006 seconds or 6 milliseconds to travel back and forth. Now the stations calculate the distance much more precisely and can exactly tell how the satellite moves. What appears to be a circular orbit is in reality anything but that. Earth's gravity is not equally distributed, which means the Earth pulls slightly different pretty much everywhere. However, you can't really measure it on the ground precisely enough because there are disruptive factors like vibrations all over the place which we cannot feel but instruments do. A human walking on the ground for example already causes shockwaves, which you could detect from afar, not to mention trucks, even noise or crust movements of the earth. Now these crust movements are also detected by geodesy. The molten or partly molten lava below rises as it is heated up in the core and falls back down as it starts to cool. Hot material rises because it has a lower density, the atoms are moving faster and just need more room. This means the gravity below such a hotspot is lower because the total mass of the lava decreases per volume as it gets hotter. However, that's not all because as mentioned, the rising lava can also cause the crust to bulge slightly, which again leads to more lava in total, reversing the previously mentioned effect. So I hope you agree it's quite complex and ever changing, making it so important to study. The method used to determine the satellite's exact position is called triangulation and requires multiple stations to measure the distance at once. The distance between the stations can be measured with the lasers as well, so having three stations for example and a satellite up top is enough to calculate all unknown variables precisely with basic algebra. Next to that, GOIK is also equipped with a radar altimeter and GPS. Knowing its position, it can create a three-dimensional map of the ground all by itself, which also is a part of Geodesy. If everything goes according to plan, Breeze will have boosted the satellite to a transfer orbit reaching 1000 km. There it will hopefully perform its final burn to circularize the orbit and release GOIK2, which will then go on by itself. I'm not sure if Breeze will have enough fuel left, but it is absolutely capable of doing a deorbit burn and re-enter back into the atmosphere. Okay, that was Kenyu's episode. Wait, wait, wait. I'm not sure if you have noticed it in the beginning, but I changed the intro slightly. I guess the can already explains what Patreon is, and I originally planned to release a video about it, but couldn't find the right words yet. I honestly don't know what to expect to come out of it, and if you want to know more, just follow the link in the description. Now, the reason I mention this now is because I have my first Patreon, so thank you, Torben, for this kind of support. However, every kind of support is welcome and I appreciate everything. Thank you. Okay, now that was Kenyu's episode 42 about Rokot and I hope to see you in the next one if you like. Auf Wiedersehen and thank you for watching.